Have you ever thought that you just need a new adventure? Your life is so routine, it's so mundane, it's so ordinary. If only I could have something different, you might think. And, and, and you know, the routine, day after day after day, I just kind of go through the routine. Well, I want to caution you this morning a little bit about that. You know, something could happen in a moment that changes your life and uh, make you long for the routine that you have now and the abilities that you have now. We've asked um, Sig Novak to share with us a little bit about his story, how one just ordinary work day, an incident happened that changed his life for as long as he lives in this world, and uh, how God has helped him to accept that and the faith that has been developed through that in Jesus Christ. Weathering many, many storms, even before my construction accident in 1985. Uh, growing up, I've learned to uh, endure it all, many storms, many different setbacks. I was a seasoned carpenter by, in 1985 when I had my accident. I went early, had to wake up real early to get down to this job, job site to uh, repair a chimney roof, and it was raining. I can remember it very vividly that morning. It was drippy, wet, and all soggy, and then wanted to just uh, hurry up and get this job done so I can get home to my house in Hellertown where I wanted to remodel our, my, our house that I bought and just try to get back as quick as possible early morning. And then I think I just was thinking about uh, what I had to do at my house other than the job site and I turned around and lost balance in the ceiling and I fell through a chimney opening a good 16 feet and probably landed in a sitting position and just kinked my spinal cord just enough and then as I, as I was tumbling and rolling down the hole into the basement landed on my uh, back and probably twisted it real hard and I knew with the split second that I, something went wrong. And I, uh oh, I am definitely injured here. But I just tried to maintain and maintain my composure. Tried to move around a little bit, move my arms and legs, and they're not moving. And then, and then I panicked. I screamed. I probably. Uh, just lost it at that given moment. I said, come on, we gotta get going. We gotta try to get my arms moving, Mara. Try to get up, try to get up. And then I did not even know what was happening. But then sooner or later, the paramedics came, maybe an hour later, took me to the hospital and they treated me and they really didn't know my extent of the injury, injuries, but uh, overall, the next couple of days with x-rays, they realized that I was paralyzed from the neck down as a, as a quadriplegia limited on my limbs. The doctors were just trying to keep me alive. Within two weeks, I had pneumonia. I went to a good rehab hospital in Denver, Colorado for at least three months. Had three or four surgeries and strengthening my body from head to toe. Took me a few weeks uh, of uh, just laying in the hospital that I realized what would be the next couple of years, next decade, and even today, that I have to accept what God gives us. Psychologically, I have learned to accept my disability, and I made many, many mistakes, and I regretted it, and God has shown me how to draw through His strength. I can draw strength through Him, and He just gives us the strength to pursue any any hardships, any storms, and why do good things happen to bad people? It just makes good people even better. We're in the midst of a study that we call Fault Lines, a sermon series as well as small groups that are meeting. And uh, today we want to talk about weathering a perfect storm, weathering a perfect storm. Fault lines are the, the unexpected 
difficult situations that come into our lives. You know, I was thinking about that unexpected part. Uh, we never plan for a day for something bad to happen. You know, sometimes bad things happen or difficult things happen, and we say, oh, this is the worst day for that to happen. Well, what's a good day to plan a bad thing to happen or a difficult thing? There is, not, there is no good time, but it's the unexpected, difficult uh, things that, that happen to us. And we, we want to notice several things about the perfect storm. We're looking at Acts chapter 27, verses 16 to 44. And I'm not going to read all the scriptures. I'll read some scripture from this uh, passage this morning, but not all of it. And uh, if you're one of those people who thinks the Bible is boring, uh, just read this passage of scripture. Read uh, Acts 27 and uh, kind of put yourself with the Apostle Paul and uh, the, the other prisoners and the sailors and everyone that was on that boat and uh, see whether you can't find some excitement in the Bible because certainly this was a, a very difficult uh, period of time uh, for uh, the Apostle Paul and, and Luke is describing it in so much uh, detail to us and I, I would encourage you to read that and, and see the adventure that really is in the Bible. But s several things that we want to notice about the perfect storm. First of all, a, a perfect storm is unexpected. It, it comes without uh, notice. Have you ever noticed that many times when, say, a hurricane is about to hit, how calm and peaceful it is? That we even have an expression, the calm before the storm. Uh, it just seems like it, it can't possibly be that there's a hurricane coming. The, the sun is shining and maybe just a gentle breeze. And if you happen to be at the shore, you might notice that the, the waves are starting to get a little rougher. But it certainly doesn't seem like there's anything to panic about. Uh, but the storm is coming. And if it wouldn't be for the ability of uh, uh, meteorologists to give us warning when a storm is coming, we would be totally unprepared. But often on that nice sunny day before the storm, you will see property owners out boarding shut their uh, windows and, and maybe even their doors, and there might even be uh, a, a call from the government for everyone to evacuate their homes and evacuate cities, especially if it's along the shoreline, because the storm is coming. But when many storms come in our lives, we don't know they're coming. They're, they're, they're totally unexpected, and they hit us suddenly. And uh, so, uh, you know, kind of as we're, we're just sailing along smoothly, a big uh, crisis can strike us. And because we have no advance warning, the crisis takes us by surprise, and we are unprepared. And, and as this passage uh, begins to, to share in, in Acts 27, 13, it says, when a gentle wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. They, they thought, well, this is such, such a nice day and a calm day. We're just going to set out sail. They were heading from Crete to Rome to take prisoners there to Rome. Uh, the conditions on, on the Adriatic Sea were favorable. A gentle south wind was blowing, so the sailors transporting Paul and the others weighed anchor and sailed the shore along the shore of Crete. What could possibly go wrong with such, in such perfect conditions? But we notice that, it, that a perfect storm strikes with fury. It strikes with fury in Acts 27, verses 14 to 15. Before very long... Uh, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven by it. A, a, a very powerful and vicious typhoon arose as they set sail and buffeted the ship that was, being, that was carrying the Apostle Paul to Rome to stand trial before the Caesar. And it swept the ship along its turbulent path in spite of the crew's efforts to avoid it. I mean, the, these were sailors. These were trained men. These were experienced men. They'd been on the sea before. And yet, when they, they gave it their best, they were trying to save the ship. They were trying to direct the ship and were not able to do it. Have you ever felt the fury 
of a perfect storm in your life. You felt helplessly locked in its grip as it swept you along. Most of us feel helpless in a perfect storm, don't we? When something happens that just overtakes our life unexpectedly, and uh, we, we feel helpless against it. The second thing that we notice is that the perfect storm may cause despair. Uh, our actions may prove useless against the storm. In Acts 27, verses 16 to 19, it says, As we passed through the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. These frantic sailors were hardly able to secure the lifeboat, and, and they tried to hold the ship together by putting ropes around it to keep it together. They, they dropped anchor. They tossed the cargo overboard. They even jettisoned the tackle, but nothing worked. A perfect storm crisis is too big. It's too difficult for us to handle in our own wisdom. We are helpless. Have you ever sat by when you're trying to find a job and, you, and you've sent out the resumes and you've made the phone calls and you've checked the internet sites and, and you've done all that you can do to try to get a job and there's no answer, there's no response, there's no call for you to get a job and, and it seems uh, that you're helpless. Or perhaps you felt the grip of a relentless uh, illness uh, when the doctors and the medications and the treatments fail. They try one thing, they try another thing, they tell you something else. You have two doctors and they tell you two different things. You're, you're, you feel helpless in that kind of a crisis situation. And, and in the midst of that, our hope may vanish. It, it seems like the storm is going to last forever. And, and there doesn't seem any way out. In Acts 27.20 20, it says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. As, as the storm raged and the sailors' efforts failed, they abandoned all hope of that ship being sail, saved and, and those aboard. And, and the, the sailors despaired. And, and like them, we despair when a crisis defies our efforts to survive the storm. We may lose hope, but it's often in the midst of that storm, that God puts his arms around us and when we eat, reach the end of our rope. And then the third observation is that the perfect storm tests our faith. A perfect storm tests our faith. I, th I think of Job and how Satan uh, went before God and kind of accused God and, and said, well, there's nobody serving you. And Job said, have, or God said, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, anybody can serve you when you give them everything. He's healthy, he's wealthy, he has a big family, everything is going great. Just let me test him. And sometimes the tests of life come our way and the, and the perfect storms of life will test us. And, and a strong faith weathers the perfect storm. Whatever comes our way, our, a strong faith will weather the storm. In Acts 27, verses 21 through 26, after the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have, been, would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. 
So Paul, this man of faith in the midst of prisoners and, and sailors out on the sea, he received a promise from God that no lives would be lost, and he said to them that he believed in God. And after encouraging the men, he said that they would run aground on, on a, an island. He was a man of faith, and he, he encouraged those around him. Faith meets a crisis head on. It may not end it, but it gives us the courage to see it through to the end. The difference that, that is made by our faith. And then we see that a, a strong faith is rewarded. And we're not going to read all the verses in the rest of the story from verses 27 to 44, but um, a strong faith is rewarded. And, and if you read those verses, you'll find out that this storm had lasted for 14 days. 14 days. I uh, have gone out on deep sea fishing trips a couple of times, and one time I got seasick. And I was only out there a few hours, but I guarantee you, I was glad to put my feet on land after just being seasick a few days. I cannot imagine 14 days in this kind of a storm that, that was uh, buffeting them. And uh, they actually, the sailors, uh, tried to escape through lifeboats. Uh, but uh, Paul said, if you leave this ship, you're, then you're not going to be protected by God. And so they cut the ropes to the lifeboats and let them sail off, and they stayed on the, sh on the ship. And although the storm blasted the ship apart, all 276 men on board escaped to dry land by floating on planks or swimming ashore or hanging on to other parts of the ship. God honors the faith that we place in our, pro in our promises. You see, we talked about this a few weeks ago when Jesus said that a wise man builds his house on the rock, but when the storms come, that it will withstand the storms. We face the exact same storms as unbelievers. Somehow there are those who have gotten the idea and, and even preach it and teach it and write books about it, that if you become a Christian, that you will escape all of the difficulties of life. That God's whole purpose in you coming to Christ is make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Well, where did, I, I don't know, do they read the Bible? I mean, here's the Apostle Paul in this trial, and he had many other trials and difficulties. The prophets, the, the, the men and women who stood true to the word of God often were imprisoned, beaten, uh, martyred for their faith. Uh, the other apostles and, and the early Christians were, were persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. Even Jesus himself died a sinner's death on the cross, the, the most cruel punishment that the Roman Empire could could configure for the most desperate of sinners and, and, and those who had broken the law. Jesus suffered for us. Don't think that if you become a Christian that somehow you were, will bypass the storms of life. But the difference is that you will go through them with Jesus. If we look only at the storm, we will be distressed. But if we trust in God and His Word, we will be at rest. And people of faith point others to Jesus. You see, when others are despairing, when, when others think that, that our world and our culture is beyond hope, when, when others are facing physical difficulties or financial difficulties and they think that it's beyond hope, Christians, people of faith, who are in the midst of the same kind of storms can point others to Jesus even in the midst of of the storm, and after the, the storm, we will re, we, he, he will reward our faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, Peter writes, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him 
and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. You see, your goal in living a Christian life is not to always be healthy, not to always be comfortable, not to always be made happy. Your goal is the salvation of your soul. And many times God uses the perfect storms in our life to draw us to Him and to make us more like Him. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, it says, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Whatever we suffer in this world will be rewarded in eternity. It's the promise of God. Christ followers face the same storms as those who do not follow him. The difference is the hope that we find in Jesus Christ. So many in our world today are hopeless. And our hope is in Jesus Christ. You can can choose to face your storms alone, but they will overwhelm you. I encourage you today to choose to follow Jesus, to take Him as your Savior, to be a disciple and a follower of Him, and He will take you through the storm. He has promised, I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. And so no matter how great the storm, no matter what we are hit with in these unexpected storms, these perfect storms, no matter what comes our way, our faith in Jesus Christ can hold and his presence can go through with us. It's your choice. You can go it alone or you can go with Jesus. And I encourage you this morning to choose to follow Jesus, that he would go with you in all of the storms of life. If you're here this morning and you have never received Christ as Savior, perhaps you already prayed and asked Jesus to be your Savior at communion, but if you haven't asked Jesus to be your Savior, I would encourage you this morning to pray and ask Jesus to be your Savior. In the midst of my closing prayer, I'm going to pray a prayer of confession and repentance. And if you mean that in your heart, if you say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I'm going to turn from my sin, I'm turning to you, and I make a decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ, if you mean that in your heart, you can leave here today knowing that your sins are forgiven and that Jesus Christ is your Savior. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your great love and mercy and grace to us. And Lord, we thank you for your abiding presence with us in the storm. And Lord, when we gather to worship, we, we sense your presence and, and we feel you near. But sometimes in the storm, the, the storm rages so strongly that we don't even feel your presence. But Lord, whether we feel your presence or not, you have promised that you would go with us. And we thank you for that. But Lord, there may be some among us today and we rejoice that they are here who may not have ever asked Jesus to be their Savior. May this be the day that they ask Jesus to be their Savior and that they would follow Him. May any who need to be forgiven of their sin pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I confess my sin. I was born in sin. I have committed acts of sin. And I confess to you today that I'm a sinner. And I repent. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. And I ask you, dear Lord, to be my Savior, to forgive my sin. And I choose today to follow you, to be a disciple of Christ, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and to live for you the rest of my life. Lord, I pray that you would answer this prayer in the hearts of those who have prayed it. And Lord, may you do a mighty work in their lives. May you be glorified and send all of us out into this world. There are a lot of hopeless people in this world. There are a lot of helpless people. There are a lot of people in the storm and they don't know Jesus. May we be people of faith who point others to Jesus in the midst of their storm. And Lord, may many come to know Christ because of the testimony of the people in this room. We'll give you honor and glory and praise for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.